On a pitch black night, miles above the Indian Ocean, a fire rages on board a fully loaded Boeing 747. 140 terrified passengers rush to the front of the cabin in a desperate bid to escape the suffocating smoke. The pilots put the aircraft into a terrifying dive, desperately fighting to get their aircraft on the ground. Will they be able to make it to a small island in the middle of the ocean, or will the flames consume their chances? This is the horrifying story of South African Airways Flight 295, and it's a story with a puzzling twist. On the night of November 27th, 1987, 140 passengers and 19 crew boarded a South African Airways Boeing 747 at Taipei in Taiwan. They were bound for Johannesburg in South Africa, with a stopover in Mauritius. This was a long journey, with the flight time to Mauritius being 10 hours. To this day, the real story of Flight 295 is still shrouded in mystery and conspiracy. Key people disagree about what happened on board the plane as it made its way over the southern Indian Ocean. And that's because, from the very beginning, this was not an ordinary flight. In this video, we're going to try to piece together what happened Flight 295, using three key jigsaw pieces. The story begins in Taipei, as the passengers boarded and as cargo was loaded onto the aircraft. South African Airways used a version of the 747 known as the Combi, as it combined both passengers and cargo on the same deck. The front two-thirds of the massive plane were used to carry passengers, while the rear third was used for cargo. The majority of the passengers were South Africans returning home, though there were also many Japanese and Taiwanese nationals on board, as well as some passengers from Europe and Australia. Up in the cockpit was a highly experienced crew. The captain was David Ice, a 49-year-old former Air Force pilot with nearly 14,000 hours of flying experience. In a matter of hours, he would be face to face with one of his worst nightmares, something he had been quietly concerned about for years. Sitting to his right was 36-year-old First Officer David Hamilton. Hamilton had over 7,000 hours total flying experience, and like the captain, about 4,000 of these were on the 747. Behind the two pilots was 45-year-old flight engineer Giuseppe Bellagarda. He too had thousands of hours flying the 747. On this night, he would be the first to discover the true nature of the emergency. Given the length of this flight, there were two more flight crew in the cockpit, ready to take over during the flight's long cruise over the ocean. These were 37-year-old relief pilot Jeffrey Burchell and 34-year-old flight engineer Alan George Daniel. All appeared normal as the crew readied their massive aircraft for departure for what was one of the longest routes in the airline's network. But if some accounts of this incident are to be believed, something has already gone seriously wrong. We'll return to what this might be in a moment. At a quarter past ten that night, the 747 was pushed back from the gate at Taipei. The 140 passengers settled in for the long journey, while the pilots began readying their aircraft for takeoff. The route to Mauritius would be an unusual one. In the 1980s, South Africa was an international pariah. It was ruled by an extremist, racist government, and this meant that dozens of countries had banned it from flying in their airspace. Flights coming from Europe had to circumnavigate the entire African continent to get to South Africa. And tonight, Flight 295 would be no different. It would first have to fly south, over the South China Sea, avoiding Southeast Asian airspace, before skirting along the Vietnamese coast, and then finally turning southwest to head towards Mauritius. These restrictions would form a crucial part of one of the scenarios which we'll explore shortly. If you're not a fan of restrictions, then you'll need to get Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN allows you to unlock your favourite movies and TV shows from all around the world by bypassing national restrictions. So, if you're abroad in a country like China where YouTube is banned, you'll still be able to watch these episodes of Green Dot Aviation. I like to use Atlas VPN when I'm buying things online, 
because companies can't artificially increase the price based on my location or on whether I've searched for that product before. So whether I'm booking flights or hotels or just buying stuff online, I know I'm getting the best price. It's even got a built-in ad blocker and malware blocker, which notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. All of this is especially important if, like me, you use Wi-Fi in public places like airports or cafes. And best of all, Atlas VPN is now running a huge discount. By clicking on my link in the video description now, you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 per month. And this deal covers all of your devices. And if you don't like it, you get your money back with their 30-day money-back guarantee. So click my link in the video description and get your Atlas VPN membership at a huge discount. Now, back to the video. At 25 minutes past 10 local time, Flight 295 rocketed down the runway at Taipei and lifted off into the pitch black sky. The captain turned the plane south and began the long journey towards Mauritius. About half an hour after takeoff, the flight reached its initial cruising altitude, high above the South China Sea. The pilots continued south along their planned route making routine position reports to air traffic controllers at Hong Kong, Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur. So far, everything was going to plan. About 90 minutes after takeoff, the pilots also made a routine call to a radio station operated by South African Airways, all the way over in Johannesburg. This station was known as ZUR, Z -U -R, and it was manned 24-7 by a radio operator employed by South African Airways. The purpose of ZUR was to enable the airline to keep track of its fleet of aircraft around the world and to deal with any problems as they arose. It was considered an important service by the airline at a time when the country's political situation made it very difficult to operate internationally. In fact, South African Airways was one of only two airlines in the world which had such a service, the other being British Airways. But on this night, something unusual would happen at ZUR. Highly unusual, in fact. This something would pave the way for a frighteningly sinister interpretation of events, which we're now about to see unfold. As the pilots chatted in the cockpit, a bar service went through the passenger cabin. This was followed shortly after by a dinner service. This is typically how meals are served on long haul flights departing late in the evening. Dinner and drinks are served and then the passengers sleep until the plane reaches its destination. Naturally enough, the pilots didn't get to enjoy the full range of what the drink service had to offer, but when the dinner service came round, they were served the food from the first class cabin. However, after so many years of the same meals, the food had lost its appeal, and the pilots complained about it to each other as they ate. We know this discussion about dinner took place, because the cockpit voice recorder contains several minutes of it. But, if you've watched a few of these videos, you know that the cockpit voice recorder only records the final 30 minutes of the flight. And this is where the first peculiarity of this flight emerges. Flight 295 does not crash in the next 30 minutes. In fact, it will spend the next 8 hours traversing the southern Indian Ocean. Why then is there a discussion about dinner on the cockpit voice recorder? Dinner, which took place near the beginning of the flight, hours before the plane would end up declaring an emergency to Mauritius Air Traffic Control. This is where the first of those three puzzle pieces I mentioned earlier comes in. Let's listen to the audio from the cockpit voice recorder. This reveals the very moment when the quiet calm of the cockpit is disrupted by the first sign of trouble. Don't be fooled by the calm in the pilot's voices. 
they were now facing the worst kind of emergency an aircraft can face, an in-flight fire. If you've seen my video on Swiss Air Flight 111, you know how quickly fire can consume an aircraft. Immediately, the pilots of Flight 295 got to work, tearing through checklists and trying to determine the nature and source of the fire and extinguish it. Within seconds, the extent of the fire was becoming apparent. Those popping circuit breakers the flight engineer mentioned were popping because the fire was burning through the electrical wires they were connected to. This wasn't just some cigarette smoke triggering the smoke alarm. This was fast becoming an inferno. The pilot's instruments indicated that the fire had taken hold in the main deck cargo area, just behind the passengers. They had to extinguish it, and fast. If they had any chance of making it down alive, they had to act now. But after tripping dozens of circuit breakers, the fire's next victim was none other than the wires connected to the cockpit voice recorder itself. This was the last sound recorded by the cockpit voice recorder as the fire burned through the wiring, supplying it with power. As far as our investigation is concerned, we are now left in the dark. And in this darkness lie two possible scenarios, two beacons of light. Where was Flight 295 when the cockpit voice recorder blinked out of existence? Was it here? Or was it here? To help us answer that question, we need to take a look at the second of the three puzzle pieces. What you're about to hear is the recording of the conversation between Captain Ice and an air traffic controller at Mauritius. This is separate from the recording we just heard, which was internal audio from the cockpit. This audio is a tape recording from the control tower at Mauritius. The pilots were now about 200 miles from Mauritius, descending rapidly to 14,000 feet. Now, this audio should settle it, surely. It shows that the plane had made it all the way across the ocean to Mauritius before the fire started. So, what must have happened is that the cockpit voice recorder recorded the outbreak of the fire about 200 miles from Mauritius, but then the fire cut off the power supply to the recorder, and shortly after, the pilots began descending and contacted air traffic control. It all fits. Except, there's still that issue of the discussion about dinner. Pilots did not eat dinner just before beginning their descent. And yet, it appears that the fire began just as the pilots were eating their dinner. So, we're left with two possibilities. The dinner conversation has the fire starting here. But the air traffic control recording puts the fire here. Which could it be? It probably seems fairly obvious at this point that the fire must have broken out close to Mauritius. The pilots declared an emergency to air traffic controllers there, after all, 
and not to controllers in Thailand or Malaysia. Captain Ice and his crew were well aware that an onboard fire required them to divert immediately to the nearest possible airport. Normally, once a fire begins, pilots have less than 20 minutes to land their plane before it is entirely consumed by flames. So it stands to reason that the fire occurred close to Mauritius, because that's where the pilots attempted to land. If the fire had broken out while the plane was here, close to Asia, then the plane would have attempted to divert to somewhere in Thailand or Malaysia. Or at least that's how the picture looks if we leave out the third and final jigsaw piece. Near the start of this video, I mentioned the radio outpost called Zur, operated by South African Airways in Johannesburg. It's manned 24 hours a day, and it stays in regular contact with all of the airline's aircraft around the world. And thankfully, these conversations are recorded on tape. The tape recorders run all day, picking up everything said between the station and the pilots. Perhaps we can use this tape as a way of squaring off these inconsistencies we've found so far. Maybe it will tell us for sure where the plane was when the pilots first became aware of a fire. But here's the problem. The tape for this night has disappeared. The one from the night before exists, stored safely in Zur, and the one from the night after exists too. But the tape which covers the critical period during which Flight 295 would have been in contact with Zur has vanished. Why might this crucial piece of evidence have disappeared? Is it just an unfortunate coincidence? Or is there something on that tape that South African Airways doesn't want the world to hear? Just like in a jigsaw, when a piece is missing, we can still see its shape, in the space it leaves behind. The very absence of the Zur tape is itself a piece of evidence. And that evidence points us to a disturbing scenario. One which involves not one fire, but two. Consider the following. In 1987, South Africa was engaged in a violent war against its next door neighbour, Angola. To fight this war, it needed massive supplies of weaponry and equipment. But it had a major problem. South Africa was under an arms embargo at the time, which made it exceedingly difficult for the military to get its hands on the weapons and equipment it needed. As a result, the country's government did the unthinkable. It began to use commercial passenger jets to transport weapons of war in order to fuel its military operations in Angola. Specifically, it contracted Arms Corps, a military arms manufacturer, to supply it with missiles, chemicals and other arms, which it loaded on board passenger aircraft operated by South African Airways. A number of top-ranking officials at the airline had been employed by Arms Corps and were all too happy to use the airline to transport these goods. Many pilots who flew for South African Airways were aware that this was taking place and were uncomfortable with the practice. In fact, in interviews in the years following Flight 295, Captain Ice's own wife had recalled that on numerous occasions, her husband had expressed his concerns about being forced to sign off on cargo, which he felt was unsafe to carry. Importantly, South African Airways was in serious breach of international law for doing this. If it was found to be carrying weapons of war on board passenger aircraft, the airline would be done for. South Africa would be shut off from the rest of the world. With this established, let's go back to that third puzzle piece, the missing Zur tape, and see where it fits. Let's play out a scenario which fits the available evidence. It's the middle of the night, and South African Airways Flight 295 cruises high above the South China Sea. As the pilots chat amongst themselves, an alarm sounds in the cockpit. In the cargo compartment, just behind the passengers, smoke has started billowing out from one of the pallets. The pilots immediately begin grappling with the problem, running through the checklists to put the fire out. The captain knows that this fire could have been started by weaponry which was illegally smuggled on board by South African Airways. He also knows that if he declares an emergency to air traffic control, 
and manages to make it down to a nearby airport, his plane will be inspected upon landing. And he knows that if this inspection turns up illegally carried weapons, the airline is done for. South Africa would lose its national airline and he would lose his job. As the pilots go through the checklists and attempt to extinguish the blaze, Captain Eyes has a decision to make. If he can put the fire out, should he continue to Mauritius or land immediately? He radios Zur in Johannesburg and asks the airline for guidance. The radio operator consults with senior officials at the airline who order the captain to extinguish the fire and continue to Mauritius. They know that if Flight 295 declares an emergency and lands now, it's game over for the airline. In this scenario, the pilots manage to extinguish the blaze and then continue on to Mauritius, where, a few hours later, the fire reignites and spells disaster. Let's say for a moment that this scenario is what took place. Surely, in those crucial moments when the fire first broke out, Captain Isa's desire to save his own life and those of his passengers would weigh more heavily on his mind than any abstract political or career considerations. Would he really risk his own life and the lives of over 100 people just to save his job and his country's airline. Without the Zor tapes, we're left in the dark as to what exactly went on this night. The radio operator on duty that night has maintained to this day that after some routine communication shortly after the flight left Taipei, he remained out of contact with the flight for the rest of its duration. However, according to others, it would have been very unusual for a flight to stay out of contact for such a long period of time. And that's why the missing Zor tapes are so important. Without them, we can't know whether Flight 295 received orders to put the fire out and continue the journey, only to have the fire reignite as it neared Mauritius, this time taking the plane down. What we do know is that there was a fire on board as the flight neared Mauritius. In the cargo compartment, just behind the passengers, the front right pallet was engulfed in flames. As the pilots put the aircraft in a steep descent, the passengers rushed to the front of the plane to escape the heat and smoke from the raging inferno behind them. A flight attendant rushed to the cargo compartment to extinguish the blaze, but dropped their fire extinguisher without ever discharging it, as the fire was too big to tame at this point. The pilots turned off the recirculation fans in an effort to prevent the spread of toxic smoke and fumes throughout the cabin. But given the intensity of the fire and the sheer amount of smoke it produced, Stopping the recirculating fans had almost no effect on the amount of smoke entering the cabin. A number of passengers died as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning as the smoke spread throughout the plane. As each checklist item failed to contain the spread of the fire, it began to burn through wiring in the aircraft's ceiling, disabling the pilot's instruments one by one. Their eyes and ears on their plane were failing, as they desperately tried to coordinate their arrival with Mauritius Air Traffic Control. They were still more than 150 miles from the airport, and time was running out. As the acrid smoke built up inside the cabin and the cockpit, the pilots reached a point in the fire and smoke checklist which called for them to do something unthinkable in a passenger aircraft. It called for them to open a door mid-flight. With the plane still thousands of feet above the water, a flight attendant rushed to the front cabin door and heaved it open. Nothing but a black abyss waited outside, accompanied by howling winds of almost 400 km per hour. Whatever relief from the smoke this brought the passengers, it did nothing to stop the fire which continued to rage on, now burning through critical aircraft systems. The noise in the cabin was tremendous as the air rushed through it and the pilots had to shout to hear each other. At night time, and with their instruments failing, it became increasingly difficult to tell what was going on. The pilots fought on for as long as they could, but it was a losing battle. The fire had now begun to weaken the structure of the aircraft itself. 
at 7 minutes past 4 in the morning local time and still over 100 miles from the airport, Flight 295 broke apart in mid-air. The aircraft impacted the water in three pieces and sank to the depths of the ocean, 14,000 feet under the surface. There were no survivors. So, what caused the fire? What was being carried in the front right pallet in the cargo compartment? The official investigation examined parts of the wreckage which were dredged up from the bottom of the ocean. However, they were unable to determine the cause of the fire. Fire experts were able to tell that the fire burned at well over 1000 degrees Celsius, which suggests that highly combustible materials must have been on board. So, if the physical evidence itself is inconclusive, what other evidence do we have to go on? What about the cargo manifest for the flight, generated in Taipei? Well, it was shredded shortly after the accident. Nonetheless, another version of it appeared over the course of the investigation, and it listed an assignment of computer components as being in the front right pallet, where the fire started. These components included lithium batteries, which are known to be flammable. This would not be the first or the last time that exploding batteries downed a passenger jet. But the kinds of batteries carried on this flight were thought by some investigators to be too small to cause such a fire. And regardless of that, they were not known to spontaneously combust. Some fire experts who examined the wreckage concluded that the intensity of the blaze was such that the ignition source must have had its own oxygen supply. Nothing on the cargo manifest fit this bill, but again, it wouldn't be the first time the South African Airways had smuggled dangerous goods on board their aircraft without listing them on the manifest. And for this reason, and the others that I've mentioned in this video, conspiracy theories about the true contents of the cargo compartment abound to this day. If you found this video thought-provoking, hit the like button, it really helps out the channel. I'm also curious to hear your thoughts about what might have happened this flight. Let me know your own theories in the comments section. I want to say a special thanks to the Patreon and YouTube members for making it possible for my team and I to keep producing these in-depth videos. If you'd like to help us make more, you can support Green Dot Aviation on Patreon. I've put the link here on screen. I'd especially like to thank Joey, Steve Wilcox, Simon Burbage, Matt O'Callaghan and Pete Familton for their very generous support. I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you soon for the next episode.